welcome to Doing the Work, the frontline stories of social change, where we bring you stories of real people working to address real issues. I am your host, Shimon Cohen. In this episode, I talk with Nathan Stevens, who is an assistant professor of social work at Illinois State University and a PhD candidate in educational leadership and policy analysis at the University of Missouri Columbia. Nathan gives a raw and vulnerable account of his experience from being in prison for selling drugs to spirituality and healing to social work. He shares about how he grew up and the trauma he experienced, as well as those who supported him, and how he wanted to find ways to give back to the community and help black youth who were born into similar conditions as he was. Nathan highlights how school was a safe space for him to get away from the abuse he experienced at home and that his academic performance was a strength. So he was excited to go back to college after prison and he excelled. He discusses how he uses his life experience to inform his analysis, teaching, research, and community work, which includes creating programs for black men teaching a course in prison called Social Justice and Social Work, and working with black male youth groups in the community. Nathan further explains that his research looks at critical topics like racialized stress and the trauma from hypersexualization and sexual abuse of black boys and men, and how we need to talk about these issues. We also discuss hypersurveillance by police in black and brown communities versus white suburbs and rural areas who gets arrested, charged, and convicted, and how arrest records can be a major barrier to employment, including being a social worker. I hope this conversation inspires you to action. So before we get into the episode, I'm so excited to tell you all about this episode's sponsor, Designs by T. T is a Brooklyn-based social worker who's created a line of t-shirts and accessories to disrupt places and spaces and the fashion industry. This t-shirt line is doing what no other social worker has done before, fusing creativity with art, and she's managed to create a local buzz. She gives 10% of all sales towards purchasing essentials for children and families in a local shelter. She's got a social work collection, a socially conscious collection, a royalty collection, a kids collection, and now she's got a doing the work collection. I'm so excited about this. We've got hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, and tote bags. So go on and get your Doing the Work merch and represent the podcast that you love. At Designs by T, that's T-E-E, designsbyt3.com. Check out the link in the show notes and take $5 off your next t-shirt order with the code TPOD5. That's T-E-E-P-O-D and the number 5. T-Pod 5. And now, here's the interview. Hey, Nathan, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. So you and I connected after the SW Cares Black Men in Social Work event, and part of us connecting was, you know, to figure out how to get, when to get you on here. And I'm so glad now you're on doing the work so we can talk about you and the work you do. And to start off, you know, really getting into like what led you to social work and the work you do, which we will then talk about later. Yeah. Um, actually, what led me to social work um, was honestly, uh, you know, being in a prison cell. Uh, and while in a, a prison cell, I had a vision of sorts uh, about working with, uh, you know, young people. Uh, and, and I envisioned this train to perdition of sorts. Uh, and, and it's kind of cheesy, but it was almost like you know, the Lone Ranger or someone riding and pulling young people off of this train. And I remember specifically, it was young men of color, young black men, uh, and helping them get off the train and taking them to safety. And it was me and a few other people. And we were doing this work. Uh, And so when I was ready to come home, I thought, I want to work with youth. I want to help young people. I want to help people like myself, who was raised in public housing, uh, my mother was addicted to crack. Uh, my dad was was never in the picture, um, those type of things. And so, uh, you know, I began to think about how I can help to kind of break those cycles 
uh, for young people in, in the community. Uh, and so I returned to school. I uh, got my BSW. I uh, got my MSW. And I began doing some of that work. Uh, and I had been doing some of it in the community because when I got released, I, I got a job doing community recreation. Uh, and the community recreation is a, is a code word for uh, my city's uh, parks and recreation division. So it's like parks and recreation, community recreation, right? It's like the black folks. <laughs> and so working with, with some of the kids, you know, from my community, um, it, it just was a passion of mine. And so as I'm going to school, uh, I decided I wanted to do this because, again, um, I wanted to give back. Um, you know, part of what led me into prison in the first place was selling drugs, right? Selling poison uh, to my community. Uh, and understanding that even though, you know, it was an economic choice per se, uh, it, you know, you, you kind of owe for that. Uh, at least, you know, you, you become a little bit more enlightened and, and a little bit sens sensitive to what you've done. Um, and so I felt like I kind of owed and I needed to give back uh, for that. And so um, that was my way of giving back was, was going into social work and trying to strengthen families uh, through you. Man, that's powerful. And I know we're going to get more into it. You know, as you're talking, one thing I'm thinking of is like, okay, so you're selling drugs, you obviously get caught, you, you know, you go to prison, and then you have this vision, right? What there was there some transformation taking place? Like, you know, where did it go from? Okay, there's this economic reality, you know, that you've got to make money and there's limited right opportunity. And so you're selling drugs, then you're in prison. There's whole bunch of different stuff I'm assuming going on in prison, then you have this vision and then you're out again and you're working with youth, you know, like, can you talk a little bit about like what that prison experience was like? Yeah, absolutely. You know, for, for me, I felt like because I had gone to college before, uh, you know, I'd gone to college uh, and then fell by the wayside, so to speak. And, and so for me, being locked up in, in, a, in, a, in a jail cell, facing 25 to life at that time, mm. that was rock bottom. Uh, I'm mean, like, you know, to have gone from a, a college classroom to this, you have did something wrong and you need to figure it out. Uh, and so when I began doing a little bit of exploration, um, it's actually the first time I cracked open the Bible, you know, and I, and I jokingly refer to, I tell people, I say, you know, you could have asked me who is Jesus Christ for a million dollars and I'd have been like, he had something to do with church. Can I get 10,000? Right. <laughs> I mean, I literally had gone to church, but I didn't really know. Uh, and so it wasn't one of those things like, you know, you hear the whole jailhouse religion thing. It wasn't so much that as it was, I needed some kind of, you know, some kind of foundation to start different. Um, and so that was kind of the, the thing that kicked off. Um, but what that did was that led me to a little bit of self-acceptance um, because the abuse that I experienced, um, part of what it did was it caused me to be traumatic. And I didn't understand that term until later on. And we'll talk about that. But you, you begin doing things like I, I need nice clothes and I need nice car and I need all these things to impress people because I wasn't OK within myself. And so that experience, religious experience, if you would, kind of helped me be OK with myself. Uh, and, and that began the transformative process to where, OK, you know, I, I'm, I'm not what I was, but you're not quite what you're going to be. And so that began the progression of moving forward. But I also had people um, that was in the jail cell with me. And I'll never forget one of the guys. He says, <laughs> he says, what are you doing here? And I'm thinking, you mean besides being accused of something like you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> right. But it, it, he said, he says, um you got them smarts. He says, I can hear it when you talk. And so that just really led me to say, good question. What are you doing here? If you, if you're intelligent, you know, you, you, you've been to college, what are you doing here? And so I began to kind of explore, uh, again, myself and, and my reality and, and, and begin to plan, uh, upon my release, the things that I can do different and how I could change my trajectory. Cause I definitely did not want to go back to that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we know the recidivism rate is high, but I think part of it is because we haven't done the work uh, internally. Uh, and when you don't do that, then you get out. The world is moving 90 miles an hour. 
right? And everything's just rush, 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 rush. And then you have the system saying, you have to get a job. Well, it's hard to get a job because I don't have a car. Well, you know, and I don't have the birth certificate and I don't have a driver's license and I don't have, you know, and so I don't care, get it, get it, get it, you know? And so you're like, ah, ah, ah. And so finally, you know, some people, they just say, well, forget it. I'm going back to the streets. Um, and I felt like I couldn't do that. I felt like, nah, you know, seeing my mom on drugs and, and having my community really suffer for, for things that myself and others did, even though, you know, it wasn't like a drug war or anything like that. At the end of the day, it's still poison that you're giving to people that look like you. Um, but one of the other things was I, I remember um, one incident where um, I bought, uh, you know, one of my clients, customers, if you would, all of her food stamps, right? And when the paper food stamps were, were, were being passed around and there were little kids in the house, man, and the refrigerator was was empty. And here I am in the kitchen you know, taking all of the food stamps and I'm looking at these kids and, um, you know, it, it just, that, that, that always stuck with me. Um, and so I, I tell people I was never a bad person. I did bad things, mm-hmm. you know? And so, um, I, I knew that the, she, the, the couple had an older daughter that was in high school, uh, that went to my high school. And so the next day I, I put all the food stamps in an envelope. And uh, I went up and I talked to one of my former uh, assistant principals. I won't call names, but I, I told him I needed to talk to this, y- this young girl. And he kind of looked at me and I said, you know me, you know, I'm not a problematic person. I've never been. I'm a smart student. And he called her down to the office and I gave her the food stamps and I gave her uh, $50. I said, when you get out of school, you go to the store, you spend all of this and then you take this cab home. Because you have younger brothers and sisters and yourself and, you know, I want to make sure that you all are eating. And so, you know, again, I, I think those are the, the things that were within me that made me, quote unquote, redeemable. Uh, you know, and again, I wasn't the monster that society likes to portray black men as. I, again, it's different between doing bad things and being a bad person. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned some stuff about trauma there. And so, you know, it sounds like Obviously, there was there was some stuff that even was going on before you were selling drugs and before you were in that situation. I don't know if you wanted to get into that now. Well, I, you know, sure, man. I mean, the thing is, if growing up in a situation where you know my mom cussed me out every day, you ignorant sob, you dumb sob, and we were we were beaten with with belts and extension cords and and that kind of thing, uh, and that was you know her dealing with her own trauma. Uh, and as you know, hurt people hurt people, right? And so going from that, it, it instilled in me a, an inadequacy, you know, and and so having dealt with, dealt with that, you know, and not having any money because we're poor, right? And, and so the, the dealing gave me uh, an opportunity to have nice things and at least feel a little bit better about myself. And, you know, there's this notion of, uh, you know, once you have a nice car and nice clothes and people know you have a little bit of money, they treat you a little better. Um, and so then that became a bit of an, addic- an addiction in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I make the argument that m- most of the time drug dealers themselves are addicted to selling drugs. Right. And so, uh, again, using bad means to try to feel better about myself and the bad experiences um, and then getting to the situation or to the point where I'm, you know, OK, you got to find another way to redeem yourself. Uh, and so once I kind of felt a little better about myself, I felt like now I need to go back and help others. So then you get out, you're doing, you know, some of that community work and you and then you decide at that point to get into a BSW program. Yeah, I, I knew before I came home that I was going back to college. I, I felt like. I, I don't know how well, really, I'll say this since sixth grade, I, I remember in sixth grade, I knew um, that for someone like me, education was one of the few avenues that I had that I could pursue and, and be good at. Uh, I like to joke, I come from a fairly athletic family and, and I was never the, the first team athlete. I, I was more second or third, um, but I was smart. I was always smart. I was always good in books. I was always a bit of a, of a nerd, a geek, right? Um, and so 
I knew that was a strength. I knew that that was something that I could lean on. That was something looking back over my childhood, I always got the good grade cards and the little awards and certificates and things like that. And so just doing a little bit of self-assessment, what can you do to put yourself forward and never end up in a situation like this again? And again, you got somebody that just randomly that you don't even know telling you, you got them smarts. Mm -hmm. And so piecing that together to feel like, you know, I can get an education um, and make a little money legally, (laughs) right? And help out and and kind of redeem uh, the community in in many ways, or at least do my part. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not a superhero or anything like that. It's just, you do your part. uh, And, 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 and if nothing else, don't do any harm. What was it like to, you know, go from prison, then doing community work. And then like, now you're sitting in a college classroom. Like, what was that, you know, and now you're in class. Like, I mean, what was that experience like? Um, you know, it was, it was, again, I've always been confident, uh, in my, my intellect, uh, my ability to think, uh, my ability to, to, again, hit some books, uh, you know, now if you, if you want to outrun me, if you want to lift weights, I, I, I know that I might not be the fastest or the strongest, but I like my chances with the books. Right. So going in, I was excited to kind of go back into my strength. Right. Um, and, and that's also very uncommon for, for black men and boys in terms of their K through 20 experiences, where there's the school to prison pipeline and all that kind of thing, um, versus actually that was my strength, uh, was being able to, you know, hit the books, uh, with the free lunch program. So I don't have to worry about the abuse because again, uh, at that time in my life, the classroom was safe, mm-hmm. right? Um, can't necessarily say that about, you know, a lot of schools nowadays, but for, for me, that was safe. So I was anxious to go back to where I was strong, where it was safe. Um, and to be able to do that and then to, to graduate and, and my family was proud. And, and also at that time when I graduated, uh, my, two of my cousins graduated with me on the same day, you know, and, and we all came from single parent households, public housing, their moms didn't necessarily go on drugs, but mine did. But we were all from the same hood. Uh, and so three black men graduating from college the same day, we made the local newspaper. The vice president of the college came to the church where we had a little reception. Um, you know, at that time, I connected with state representatives and, you know, civic leaders. And so some of them was there. So that just kind of like, OK, this 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 thing, this college thing is kind of paying off for you. Yeah, you're feeling pretty good. <laughs> right. right. And, yeah. and, you know, and I and I was on the dean's list. Right. Um, I graduated with three point seven two GPA, uh, you know. Um, and so even that is a story in and of itself, because I was working during the day and going to school at night at an evening mm-hmm. program. And um, one one day, uh, you know, a guy who's my mentor to this very day, he comes to me and says, hey, you know, you're going to Columbia College. Do you know my wife? And I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, wait a minute. What do you mean? A wife? You know, white guy. Right. And I say, what's her name? And so he says, well, you know, the same last name as me. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I think I, I got some kind of letter from her. Uh, she wanted me to be involved with some kind of program. Right. Well, him being who he is, he went back and asked her about the program. And it was the who's who's in America's colleges and universities. And she's like, you know, your custodian, your janitor has a 3.72 GPA. And he was like, what? And so Mm. the next day he saw me, he says, hey, you know, when you get done, come and see me. I want to I want to offer you a job. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, it's white guy. Who's who's this white guy? You know, he's nice enough. Appreciate it. But he did. And, and short, long story short, he actually was the one that called me um, and offered me a job to to come and work in higher ed after I'd finished my master's degree. And, uh, you know, I reached out to him and I said, hey, you know, is that still available? And he says, well, I don't have anything. And a few months later, uh, he helped me get on at the University of Missouri as the director of the Black Culture Center there. Uh, and so I could take my my desire to help young people that was coming from Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, Dallas, inner cities, and be a support for them. And I created programs, particularly for black men, um, that 
actually, I created a program uh, in 2009, and it's still going to this very day. And and I've been away for you know I've been in Illinois for seven years. So uh, that foundation was there, and and it just just meaningful to me to to have created something that's helping young black men again. Going back to that vision, yeah. I mean, it's so amazing when you can create something and then you see the power, you know, the impact that it has and then you move on, but it's still going, right? It's like, that's a powerful thing right there. So then you left that, you left that program and how'd you get into teaching? Like, did, had you already started teaching when you were there? Yeah, actually, I began adjunct teaching uh, while I was there. I uh, did it for, I think, a couple of years, um, you know, uh, teaching classes like working with minority youth. Well. You know, that's what I've done. Uh, And so bringing that, you know, that perspective uh, into the classroom uh, with students uh, that to me, I you know, try to make it more experiential so that it's not just reading from a textbook. But these are kind of the lived experiences that I've had, Um, you know, um, currently working at Parks and Rec part time and that kind of thing. Uh, I was more just to stay connected to the community than for money. Um, And so. When I left that campus, uh, went to another school, um, I didn't teach, but I still connected with, you know, young black men on that campus, left that campus, went to another campus, uh, connected with young black men and Latinx men, and also began to start teaching again. And that's when I had the opportunity uh, this spring to teach social justice and social work um, at Danville Correctional Center. Uh, And so... Again, I remembered how meaningful it was to have uh, church visitors, you know, coming in and visiting. And, and, you know, one of the groups that visited me while I was in uh, prison in Oklahoma is where I was at, um, was a guy that I'd actually went to college with uh, as a freshman. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, just seeing him was like, man. So I was I was I was ashamed that, you know, you haven't seen me in quite some time. And when you do see me, it's here. Uh, But his, his man, his gentle nature and just being a great guy that he is, he never shamed me. He never did any of that. We reconnected. Um, He actually helped with bringing, you know, my daughter's mom to come and see me and was just really supportive. Uh, And so this is one of those people that also inspired me to where I didn't want to let this guy down, you know, because he's been great to, uh, you know, to try to help where he could in terms of uh, being a support, um, you know, him and his wife and his family would, you know, pick my, you know, my daughter's mom and her up and, you know, would take them to little family gatherings and stuff because, I mean, there was a void there because, you know, I am locked up. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, again, there's all of these people that poured into me. And so, again, that helped me to understand that people have helped you. You need to help and give back. And so those are the kind of conversations that I have with the men is I said, you know, and and I will say this, that class, and it was it was it was one of the most intellectually stimulating and challenging classes. I I will tell you, uh, those guys are brilliant. I mean, when we talk about social justice, they get it right. But my challenge to them was we need you at the same intellectual level the same character, the same zeal that you have here. We need you to find a way to keep it once you're released because your your families and your communities need you on this educated knowledge, giving back, um, you know, level. And so uh, it was it was it was very, very rewarding for me to give back and to hear them say that they really appreciated me coming in because I told them my story. You know, and, and so it to them, they felt like I can go from this to being, you know, in a classroom. I, I say, yeah, you can. I say, first of all, uh, creator, God, the universe, ancestors, whatever someone believes in has to kind of be with you because I, I definitely don't want to take credit for it all on my own. But believing that that is working in my favor. Absolutely. You can do it. And, and it's not easy, but but you got to roll up your sleeves. You know, and 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 give back because I told them you owe. I told them I'm here with you all because I owed, and I'm paying some of my debt to society by coming and pouring some of myself into you. But that's because people poured themselves into me. 
That class must have been incredible. Oh, man. Um, it was. Unfortunately, it got interrupted by COVID. Mm. Um, yeah, they, they, shut the, they shut the prison down, and, and we started doing kind of a correspondence course, uh, and the papers are still excellent. You know, I mean, um, we even, I even gave them assignments like, you know, what would be the response, you know, uh, if you were a social worker, what would be your response based upon the the news information that you're getting on COVID right now? And they were very informed, by the way. Mm-hmm. Like, man, y'all are more informed than I am, right? But they they know they learned about the, the disparities in terms of who COVID was impacting and that kind of thing, and so. Um, you know, they were, were talking about that. And so I gave them assignments that says, you know, based upon your identity, uh, you know, you're a Latinx person or, or a black person and you're working at, you can make up an agency. What are some of the things that you need to look at and be aware of, um, related to COVID, you know, and, and we had some really, really good, uh, papers, uh, you know, what they would do. Are you going to like, are you going to keep doing that when things, when you're able to again? I, I would like to think I, I, I would, but the, the issue is I was at a different school. Uh, and so since that time, I went from um, working at cultural centers um, to now being a full-time faculty member. Uh, and so as I make that transition, I would like to get back to some of that. I'd like that to be part of some of the research that I engage in. Um, because my research looks at experiences with racialized stress and trauma and the impact that it has upon uh, communities of color, but particularly uh, black men. And so when you see a lot of the things that I've gone through uh, and even some of the things that we don't really like to talk about, um, such as the sexual assault and rape uh, amongst black men and boys um, that began all the way back in slavery. Right. And so we don't really talk about that as a society. And so imagine being little Wayne, who uh, was 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 raped at 11, Chris Brown at eight. Right. Uh, and, and feeling like masculinity, as it's defined um, by Western constructs, is you, you know, you know, you, you, you big man now you you've this and, and and or you're one of those middle schoolers where a teacher has been inappropriate. We've seen all the, the news and headlines uh, amongst that. So. You know, black men and boys are often, you know, hyper visualized and hyper surveilled um, as, as criminals, as potential thugs when they're in the stores and all this kind of other stuff. But then on the other hand, they're also hyper sexualized. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have these teachers looking at these 13, 14, 15 year old boys and 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 oogling and ogling. Right. Uh, and we know that it's more common amongst women. Right. Particularly black women and black girls. But it also happens to, you know, black boys and black men, um, you know, and just just over the weekend, I I saw a story on Facebook uh, where there was a 17 year old football player uh, and a friend of mine posted it. And he said, you know, this guy's going to be the next big deal in college football. And then this guy was I mean, he was built like a tank. Right. And a lot of women were comment, ooh, what I would do to him. And it just made me think, oh, my God, right? He's 17, right? So technically, mm-hmm. he's in many states, he's, he's underage. He's not 18. Um, you know, I even think about uh, here in Illinois, Chief Keith, right? Uh, and, and I followed this story a little bit, and, and I want to share a little bit about this. So this Chief Keith was, um, he's in court right now being sued by the mother of one of his child children. Um, She's 43 last year. He was 23. Uh, And so they had a baby in 2013. Uh, At that time, the baby was six years old, right? So 2013, right, six-year-old. So 23-year-old minus six, and then, of course, nine months. So that's basically seven. 23 minus seven is what? 16. And so imagine this. So this woman is taking him to court for back child support. But no one's talking about, wait a minute, didn't you have sex with him when you were 36 and he was 16? Mm. And so she's just brazen enough to go to court, right? Not even fearing that someone, because there's no statute of limitations, you see? And so these are the kind of things that some black men and and others have to internalize, uh, you know? And so I look at some of those kind of things in terms of how do I help 
uh, put that kind of research out there to say, hey, we need to look at this. So, you know, when someone's having these, you know, uh, internal implosions that are, are caused because you've been raped and sexually assaulted, you've been physically abused, you're surviving, you know, gang violence and gun violence in your community, poverty is impacting you, right? And so you just kind of lash out and now you're locked up, Mm -hmm. you see? And so a a lot of it all has this interplay um, that we we don't talk about when we're talking about particularly low-income Black men from the inner city. So um, that's just a quick example, man. And, And I try to you know, I haven't really had an opportunity to talk about some of those things, but I do talk about diversity and social justice. And I bring those perspectives that there's a lot of information, a lot of knowledge that aren't in our books um, that needs to to be talked about and explored more in depth. You're right. It's not talked about. You know, I think about um, my social work education. I think about a lot of the books I've read, articles, all of that in You know, what's in there is, you know, stuff about drugs, poverty, you know, racism, if that's in there, (laughs) right? But not the sexual violence, not the hypervigilant stress response. There might be some stuff about PTSD, but you usually have to go out of the textbooks, right, to really get into that. And um, in your research, I I was wondering, as you were talking, you know, are you looking at... um, like what interventions or what kind of pro like what is what is needed to address these issues? Well, well first, uh, we need to to keep uh, our young people safe, uh, safe from 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 the violence in the community, safe from from being impoverished. Uh, and, 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 you know, a, a lot of times when you're impoverished, that puts you in a vulnerable situation in and of itself. Yep. Right. Again, looking at my own story, coming from having nothing and then someone says, Hey, if you, you know, when some, you know, my first time selling drugs, someone says, Hey, you know, you, you, you spend $80 and when you get done, you have 300, you know, and I've often challenged, um, people to say, tell me another investment that doesn't require education, marketing, all this kind of other stuff for a product that sells itself and is readily accessible to young people all over. That's what the lure is of, you know, illegal crime, et cetera. Um, and so because we don't have that, that makes them more susceptible. Well, it also makes them more susceptible to do things like, you know, uh, stripping and all this kind of other stuff. And it's not that there's shame in those things. It's just you have to ask, would our young women do that if they didn't have to? Would our young men sell drugs if they didn't have to? Uh, and that's not a that's not a pass to say that it's OK, um, but it also causes us to, it should cause us to look at more of the macro level things and, and what are the institutions and the policies and the procedures um, that are in place. I, I have a quick story. I remember when I was in Oklahoma and I actually was trying to go legit uh, and not go back to, to hustling and dealing and was working two jobs, but I was still coming up short. And so me and the mother of my child, we went down to, you know, the social services office and said, hey, you know, we just need a little bit of help. So, you know, easy numbers real quick. Say, um, you know, we say I was making 700 and we needed a thousand. Right. And so we were basically asking for the 300 difference. And they would say to us, well, if he quits his jobs or if one of you leave the relationship, we'll give you the full 1000. Mm-hmm. And you're like wait, what? That makes no sense. And so these are the kind of things that I, I think social work as a profession uh, needs to look at is how we are perpetuating oppression upon people by bureaucratic means that are not necessarily effective. But, you know, bureaucracies are more interested in efficiency. We serve X number, but how impactful was your service? You know, or the, or the programs and the things that you 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 provided, uh, and so education uh, and getting into the classroom uh, gives me an opportunity to to challenge my students to start looking at that, um, and and look beyond the stereotypes and and the, the things that you're seeing and hearing about uh, in the media uh, and on and on you know the news reports and all this other stuff, and to be more critical uh, of what's going on. Yeah, you know, 
there's a some stuff you said that one thing I wanted to get back to right about um and that and what you were just saying made me think about something else. But one thing is like I mean, look, there's a lot of white kids selling drugs in the suburbs, mm-hmm. and they're not in prison. They're not going to prison, right? So there's also that level of like hyper surveillance by police in communities of color, right? In like, it's like I think about in New York with stop and frisk, right? Mm-hmm. And who was getting stopped and frisked, which increases the likelihood of a dangerous encounter as well, right? With police, uh, potentially life-threatening encounter. That's not happening in a suburb with a, with white kids selling drugs because it's there. I mean, I grew I grew up in a town where there was plenty of drugs, right? And there weren't a lot of kids going to prison for it. Well, even even campus police. Right, uh, right. will tell you that, 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 that you know, uh, and they will tell you a lot of times they know that it's a lot of drugs coming and that kind of thing. But the notion of hyper surveillance. Um, and so, you know, if, if you 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 have these dynamics involved in black and brown communities that, you know, uh, you know, the Bible talks about ill gotten gain. Right. Uh, illegal hustling and all this kind of other stuff. So as a result of that, you know, we need more police presence. Well, the increased police presence typically means you see more crime because you have an increased presence. And to your point, but crime is occurring in the suburbs and in rural areas, too. Mm -hmm. But because you're so concentrated in a particular area and then the media says, well, all of these crimes are happening in these communities. Right. And, you know, and that's why I get so frustrated when people talk about black on black crime and I say that that is true. That's a real thing. But what you're not talking about, which lets me know that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're subconsciously even purporting white supremacist ideologies. You're not talking about white on white crime. Right. You're not talking about Asian on Asian and Latinx on Latinx. You're talking only about black on black crime, uh, again, which is, which is a stereotype, even if it's supported by the data. You're not talking about the FBI statistics that shows that the crime is based on residential patterns. So you're going to see more of that crime within a community because it's disenfranchised. It's, it's impoverished. Um, there's no businesses there. So there's no jobs. And, you know, all of these different things uh, are taking place. Um, and so it, it's just so much in that to unpack um, that it, it becomes frustrating uh, when it isn't talked about. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing I f- think of is um, when there is hyper surveillance and hyper police presence and a higher likelihood then of arrest. That's the other thing, right? Is like who gets arrested, but then who gets convicted, who gets cash bail, who doesn't get cash, right? All of that. And then I think about you and you, you've, you've said you're a convicted felon, Right. Mm-hmm. And now you're te- now you're working in higher ed. You know you're an assistant professor. Has that come up where places like said like no, we're not going to hire you? You know, I, I haven't had that come up. Uh, well, I've had one incident where um, you know my first entrance into higher ed. This is where it gets interesting. Um, again, I told you the story about my my mentor, right? I, the background was never an issue as long as I was a janitor, right? Never an issue. So I worked uh, on campus for, you know, three, four years or whatever as a janitor, no thing. Uh, so then I could graduate and all that. And now I'm wanting a professional job. Um, I get the letter of acceptance pending a satisfactory criminal background check. So I, I, I blow a gasket, I panic and I, and I, and I call the HR person. We meet and we talk and the first thing she asked me, she says, well, you're not selling drugs anymore, are you? Well, she says, do you sell drugs anymore? And I said, ma'am, let me explain something to you. If I sold drugs, I wouldn't be here asking me for a job. <laughs> you know, uh, I, and so, um, you know, I, so that, that went over well. And she talked about the importance of giving second chances and all that. And I was appreciative of that. So then I got a, a, a major promotion and I, and I won't name the school, but I left that school and went uh, for a short while to an institution where I was assistant to the president. Um, you know, I mean, I was cabinet level position. And um, so I was at the job uh, about 45 days. And all of a sudden I get called down to HR office and they're like, your background check came back. And I'm like, 
okay. I mean, I know what's on it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they're like, well, we didn't know that. And I'm like, okay. And they were like, you know, did, did, did this president know? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Did y'all tell him? And so long story short, I lost the job, right? Because, I, and, and my take was they didn't want someone with my background at that level. Right. You know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? So it was never about, can you do the job? It was more about the prestige or, or, or the appearance of, of you at that level. Uh, and so, uh, so I'm basically unemployed until I get another job that actually ultimately moved me to Illinois. Uh, and I started telling, you know, Hey, look, before I make this move, uh, you know, here's what's going on with me. And I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, no, no big deal. So, you know, that, and then the same thing with next move, Hey, Hey, you know, Oh no, no big deal. And then finally, uh, where I'm at now, uh, I'm like, hey, you know, and it was like, no big deal over here. We got to find out if it's a big deal over here. And so I called this first group like, hey, you know, I, I quit where I was at to come over here. But it ended up being not a big deal because, again, this was 20 years ago. I've been out 20 years. Uh, and I, you know, knock on wood at my desk. I, I don't even have, I haven't even had a traffic ticket. You know, uh, because again, I, it's more meaningful out here with my family and contributing to the community uh, and doing things like this than whatever I could find myself, you know, getting into um, that ultimately isn't worth it. You know, do you do you have students who, um, you know, have like felony convictions and want to be social workers and then worry about like if they're going to be able to do their internship or eventually get licensed if that's what they want to do because that comes up yeah in field education and social work programs all the time yeah i I haven't um had that happen um you know to me um personally but i I have heard the stories and i've had people say even the guys in my class that went in the prison were concerned about that. And, and there's a little bit of debate uh, amongst uh, the professionals because, uh, like, for example, in the state of Illinois, they take it on a case-by-case basis, right? Um, and, and it also is, depends upon who reviews your application for licensure and stuff like that. And so uh, I think that is the, the next social justice battle um, is to, to say, you know, again, I'll use myself, someone like me, uh, I've been out uh, you know, 20 years, I have a demonstrable record of programs that I've created um, to help youth. In addition to that, I, I can say that I actually helped select the police chief back, uh, the former police chief back in my hometown. Uh, and at the institution that I worked at the moving me to Illinois, I served on the board of fire and police commissioners. So I got to determine who got to be a firefighter and, and a police officer. Uh, and they knew about my background. I was like, hey, I, you know, and, and the mayor and the mayor told me, say, well, then you actually would be, um, you know, a, a good. And, and I actually do cultural competency training with law enforcement. So whenever these things come up, I say, hey, I do this. You know, why in the world would I do these things, uh, you know, if I was trying to do dirt or, 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 or a bad person or whatever. Right. So, you know, and, and, and in many ways it, it reeks of respectability politics, um, just being candid, but I, I will humbly say I was intentional in doing some of that. Uh, one, because I was curious about it, but two, I felt like I have a contribution to make to help, you know, police officers and others understand, you know, from, both sides. Well, now I'm on the quote unquote ivory tower side with you, right. In terms of like campus security or police departments. But then I used to be on this other side and I can kind of tell you what led me here. And, and I understand from a law enforcement perspective, you know, you break a crime, you break a crime or break a law, you break a law, you commit a crime, you commit a crime. I get that. But I also, you know, push back and say, you know, what was the narrative behind the crime, right? I mean, and so there, there's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of, of uh, leeway that they get. You know, if you, you get this little kid, he's at, you know, the grocery store and he steals some apples, right? And he tells you, you know, I only stole these or I'm trying to steal some meat because we're hungry. We don't have any food and we don't qualify for food stamps. 
I'm telling officers, can you use some type of discretion in those situations? Mm -hmm. Because I can guarantee you that kid didn't wake up and say, hey, I'm going to go to a grocery store and steal this morning. You know, uh, when he woke up, probably more likely than not, the rumbly and the tumbly led to some of that, you know. Um, And so, uh, you know, so these are the kind of conversations that I'm able to have, um, you know, from a very privileged position uh, as a faculty member now. Um, you know, versus, um, you know, just someone coming off the street trying to, to say that it, it might not be received the same. Yeah. I mean, you know, as a profession, and I understand like there's different licensing or in, in laws in each state, but as a profession, right, that supposedly, well, we are a profession committed to social justice in writing, <laughs> <laughs> in writing with our code of ethics. Like, how do we then not? push back and and try to change these um law these state laws and licensing issues for people with background criminal backgrounds when we're supposed to believe in the transformative power of people you know and and we're keeping people out of being able to do powerful work in the community who people who really actually could probably understand some of that work better than someone who never had those issues, you know, potentially, you know, so that's, that's a real, that's a real issue. I mean, it's just interesting. Cause like I have, I have a record, I don't have any felonies, but like I've had it come up at tons of jobs, you mm-hmm. know, to the point where I've had to have like appeal review hearings and stuff where like I had to get stacks of like letters to support on my behalf and explain every charge so like i have like a f- i keep like documents in dropbox actually for when i'm like applying so i don't have to rewrite it every time you know yeah i have like my my statement already ready <laughs> to go right. and, and, and you know I, I think i think it's two things um my, my thoughts on that is is twofold and and the first is that i think social work is a profession that it, it it's trying to remain credible, right? And so so it doesn't want to have one of those situations where, you know, we let this person become a social worker and they were still a monster, right? So I think there's that fear, um, which, you know, I, I think it's ridiculous, but uh, I think it's that piece. Um, but then the other piece is, you know, when you talk about Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, she says in there that even a lot of legislators of color, are afraid to appear soft on crime, you know, and those kind of things. And so, uh, you know, those licensure requirements could be changed um, with, you know, uh, some some support from, you know, CSWE, NASW, uh, NABSW, all these different organizations that says, hey, we know that disproportionately communities of color are impacted by, you know, the prison industrial complex so it's important for us to advocate like social workers are supposed to mm-hmm. and educate about, uh, you know, being being flexible. And so that's actually one of the things that I actually plan to do, hopefully within the next few years, is to apply for my license. Um, and, and it's one of those things that I'm, I'm preparing for, uh, you know, like you say, gearing up to be able to, like you said, have my documents and ducks in a row uh, to be able to say, you know, this is who I am and this is how I roll and, and, and it's not like that. And so on the one hand, I can appreciate the desire to protect children. But on the other hand, I, I feel like, you know, uh, there's a little bit of work that needs to be done to kind of fine tune that so that you're not, as you said, screening out folks who would be good candidates um, to be able to speak to, you know, uh, folks, uh, you know, I've created programs to where I'm not afraid to go into the, the, the drug zones and the, the gun violence zones to talk to the young people. Um, one of the programs I created, we told the Chamber of Commerce when we were getting uh, young people employment, we serve the hard to serve. We serve the, the gang members and the drug dealers and that we want to offer them a, a different opportunity because, again, a lot of times these kids don't want to do those things. They they just may not fully understand or feel like they have an opportunity to do anything different. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, you know, advocating and educating, and we were actually well received um, trying to do those kind of programs. So that's cool. I mean, the, you know, it's funny, the thing about like 
social work screening out people, though, is like there's plenty of social workers who don't have criminal records who do hurt people, who do do damage, right? Like who are who have bias, who have like who are racist or who are homophobic, right? And play that out and how they affect children, you know, youth, families. So that needs to get addressed too, because it's like those people can get through and, and go be social workers, but then these other people can't. Well, and 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 to your point, I, I agree. Uh, and to your point, it, it's one of those things when you look at, you know, on college campuses, right, where sexual violence is pervasive, but you're screening so hard in the admissions process for someone that may have a background, but Nine times out of 10, uh, believe me, when they let me in the, the door of Columbia College, they, you know, the person told me, we're going to give you one semester for probation. We're going to give you one try. I'm very aware that you're watching me, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, I've even had some situations in employment. I've told, you know, uh, some some powers to be, look, I know my background and I know the first person you're going to come looking for if something comes up missing. So it's not going to be me, Right. Meanwhile, we're letting people into our schools and colleges who are causing harm um, and and maybe not find out about because we know that, uh, unfortunately, our women aren't uh, believed and they don't feel supported, so they don't report. So now you're letting some of these monsters go into law and becoming medical doctors and all these kind of other things, right, uh, while the the person who was is it fresh out of jail is just wanting to to give back, wanting to help out, wanting to kind of redeem themselves, so to speak. Um, but but are, are are being, you know, finger wagged the entire the f- entire way. You know, I'm watching you again. The hyper surveillance and and so that was one of the inspirations for me to get such good grades um, and to end up with the three point seven two. I should have a three point seven eight, but. That's another story. Uh, I got played on a class, but um, I knew, you know, God told me we're going to give you one. We're going to give you a shot, you know, like you should be appreciative that we're going to give you one semester in our school. And I said, OK, yeah, I got you, player. I, I got you. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you again. I'm from Missouri. I'm going to show you, you know. And so I, I made the most of, of the opportunity, you know, but I, I knew, um, you know, that this thing is going to drag with me. Um, you know, along the way, and even some of the reform efforts like ban the box, it, that helps you get the interview. Uh, but once you get to a certain stage in the interview process, that becomes obsolete. Mm-hmm. And, and in many ways, it should. I don't want to take the decision making uh, ability away from a hiring manager. But at the same time, you know, uh, give folks an opportunity to to present themselves, to present, like you said, my packet of information, my documentation showing that, you know, who I was in 1989, right, versus who I am uh, in, in 2020, get ready to be 2021, two totally different people, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, as we're kind of wrapping up the interview, and I just so much appreciate our conversation, I feel like we could just talk about so many different things. But I just wanted to like, you know, is there anything else you wanted to to use this platform to talk about, you know, before we finish this up? Yeah, you know, I, I had um, uh, I made a, I made a note to myself because I knew I was going to get sidelined, right? And so, uh, one of the things that that um, you know I, I did say is that you know Tupac once said that uh, no one knows my struggle. Uh, it's hard to carry on when no one loves you. So I need you know I would ask people to 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 let black men know that they care, uh, and and that you, even if you have an odd way of showing it, right? Let them know that you care. Uh, and, and let black boys know that they're loved and supported, um, those that are nearest and dearest, so that should some of these things happen, they'll know that I have someone that I can talk to, someone in my corner. Um, and then show up for the programs like Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club and all of that. You know, th- th- there needs to be men in particular, I- I'm, I'm speaking to, um, to have some hope uh, outside of sports, right? I mean, sports is great, but not everyone plays. Um, and then the, the final thing uh, I would just like to say is uh, I would like to thank Illinois State University for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I mean, they have been supporters uh, from day one. Uh, I, again, I came into the situation being frank and they've been supportive. Um, and to people that are going through a tough time right now, 
um, because of the economy, because of mental health or whatever it is. Uh, I would just say, man, hang in there, uh, stick it out. Um, brighter days will come, um, you know, and, and um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, keep the, keep the fight going, um, you know, and uh, I, I'm making connections right now with black men in London, uh, black men in Toronto, black men in Nigeria, right? And oddly enough, we're fighting some of the same stuff, all of these places. Uh, and so uh, be sure to to support the folks that are doing this work worldwide, um, right? And and pour, give give a little time, give a little money if you can, uh, to to support uh, these change efforts that are that are taking place around the globe. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for saying that, and thanks for coming on here, and thanks for doing the work in the community. Appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please follow on Twitter and leave positive reviews on iTunes. If you're interested in being a guest or know someone who's doing great work, please get in touch. And thank you for doing real work to make this world a better place. 